So please put your hands together for David Amor. Thank you. Brave. Well, that's not something I've ever been called, but okay. We'll go with that. So thank you, everybody, for joining today. I am actually, it's a, my first time at 10X, surprisingly. I mean, I, I've been doing this for probably about eight or nine years now, and I, for some reason, I've never stumbled upon here, which is a shame, because it really is a fantastic conference. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, I actually want to start a little bit, you know, I, I was actually talking to <laughs> my grandmother, believe it or not, and I'm, I'm originally from Miami, Miami, Florida. So not too different from San Diego, except the people are worse, probably. No offense. I'm from Miami, I get to say that. Um, and really, you know, I think that's what's, what's really hilarious is when I was a kid growing up, you know, Cuban grandmothers, they're notorious for one thing. I'm Cuban by, uh, by background. My parents are Cuban from Cuba, from Havana. Don't ask me how they feel about the Obama policy, please, for the love of God. Um, but anyway, so when I was growing up, one of the biggest things that I would... I remember on Saturday and Sunday mornings and throughout the week was my grandmother watching these TV novellas. They call these little soap operas, right? So, you, you know, the Americans have their, you know, uh, Young and the Restless and that type of stuff. Well, in, you know, our family was Guadalupe and all these really, you know, unique sounding Spanish words and sp Spanish phrases. And I, I was talking to my grandmother the other night and it was about four or five days ago, you know, and I was getting ready to, to come over to San Diego and I said, Man, Abuela, you know, I think, I think I'm presenting on a topic, actually, that's, that's better than any novella that you've, you know, you've ever seen. This thing is, I mean, it's a roller coaster of a ride, and I, I, it's not finished by any means, and it's, it's incredible, the story of, of how we got to, you know, where we are with this Theranos, uh, you know, company. Um, you know, full disclosure, I actually wrote an article about a year ago for Theranos defending the company. So um, I actually was, a, I still kind of am a fan of the uh, technology, if it works. <laughs> <laughs> which is something we'll get into. Uh, but I actually wrote an article defending the technology and defending the company a, a year back. And then what happened is, I'll tell you honestly, and I hope if there's people from Theranos in the room, God bless you, I really hope everything goes well for the company. I really do. Uh, but otherwise, you know, what happens is over the last year, my faith has started to erode a little bit with continuous issues that have emerged, continuous uh, findings, CMS violations, uh, their CLIA exemption uh, status. I mean, all these different things have really started to pop up, and I still hope, really, for the benefit of their investors, the benefit of the technology, and for me personally, because when I see a needle, I want to pass out. So um, the first thing I'll do is, who, who hasn't heard about Theranos? Okay. Who is an expert in the Theranos case? So that I could stop talking to you. Okay, good. Um, all right, so we're going to go through a couple things today. We're going to go through a little bit of an overview about the Theranos story, for those of you who are not familiar, which is good. So there's not a ton of you who are you know, experts in this case. So we'll go through how we got to where we are today with Theranos. And we'll go through, as a quality and regulatory consultant, you know I have to bring in the regulations to this, right? So we'll go through some quality and regulatory stuff towards the end. But frankly, it's stuff that's applicable to all of you. Who's in a medical device company? Yeah, well, most of you, right? So you're going to have to learn this stuff anyway, so might as well go through it in context of Theranos. So with that being said, let's just uh, get started here. So this is my, one of my favorite sentences, and it is so apropos to this, right? In God we trust, all others bring data, right? Absolutely. This is, if Theranos would have kind of followed this, this model, um, I think we would be in less trouble than we are today. However, you know, if you look at what Theranos has been, you know, coming out with in the press and Elizabeth Holmes and her statements, you know, they believe that that's, that's the case. And they might have valid data. We, we just haven't seen the extent of it quite yet. So who knows who this is? Trivia question. William Deming, sound, uh, sound familiar? Father of modern quality. Okay, so he's a very, very good friend of mine. Not really a good friend of mine. He's, uh, I'm a little bit young for that, but that's still, he's a good, good, good mentor, a good guy. So today we'll be going over a couple things. The good of Theranos, so what happened? What is Theranos? If some of you are saying, like, you keep saying Theranos, who the, who the hell are these people, right? Or who the heck are these people? So um, we'll go through the good, you know, how they got to where they got, the bad and the ugly, and that's kind of all, it, it, really think about it this way. Up until October 2015, everything was going swimmingly for this company. I mean, there was started to emerge some questions about the technology and some questions about the founders and some questions about the uh, scientists. But overall, I mean, the, they were raising capital left and right. Everything was going swell. And then October 2015, something happened that really caused a huge downhill. And they've really been in defense mode ever since then. And we'll, we'll go through that. And also, what can we learn? You know, I think one of the big takeaways is 
we see other companies struggling, we shouldn't applaud that. We should really say, hmm, why can't, what, how can we prevent ourselves from going through those same issues? And the key theme of that part of the conversation will be, and this is kind of a surprise to a lot of people when I give this talk, but the key surprise here is Theranos is not the first company to go through this stuff. In fact, most of the violations that the FDA cited within their quality, with their 43 deficiencies, were really things that a lot of medical device companies struggle with. Now, there are some potential allegations of fraud, and that's not something that a lot of companies struggle with, but overall, in terms of just the quality system deficiencies or the quality deficiencies, it's not something that's, oh, it's the first time in the world we've seen this. But because of the press and the way that the press has tackled the story, it really has become something that a lot of people are now starting to learn what a 43 is, what a quality deficiency is, and what do we need to do to resolve them, right? Who here has been through a, a warning letter or a 43 remediation project? Not fun, right? So, you know, six month project managers always say, ah, six months and we're out. And then six years later is when it happens. So, yeah. So, this is Elizabeth Holmes. In 2003, uh, Ms. Holmes dropped out of Stanford University. She was a chemical engineer. I still, regardless, am a huge fan of her. I mean, I think that the things that she's done, regardless of, regardless of the company, personally, you know, she's a very strong character. She, she presents very well. Uh, she did a TED, a TED Med talk a few years back that I thought was fantastic. Um, so as a person, I really actually admire uh, her vision for this company. In 2003, she drops out of Stanford Biomed, right? So she, a chemical engineering program, sorry. She's 19 years old and starts this company. At that point in time, the company was not called Theranos. It was called Real-Time Cures. And really, the, the whole point of that company was to try to figure out how to extract a ton of information from a small pinprick of blood. Everyone has had a blood test. You sit there for quite a long time and you get all these little vials filled up and we'll see a comparison. You know, her goal was to see how can we make that process more seamless. So Theranos uh, wasn't even born yet, but by 2006, there's a couple things that had happened. By 2006, they had raised almost 15 to $16 million, right? So they did a series A round and a series B round. Now, the venture capitalists that raise that money are not what I would say are famous venture capitalists. You know, so the Peter Thiels of the world, they weren't part of this deal. However, you did have some pretty good backing uh, from se some several well-established VC firms, as well as private equity. And private equity uh, was the reason that they ended up in this $9 billion valuation, which we'll get to uh, shortly. But that's Theranos. Theranos in 2006. Several patents, right? A company just on the rise. Elizabeth Holmes started to be featured in some magazines. But really, the period between 2006 and 2013 was kind of what they call a stealth mode. There wasn't a ton of press. There wasn't a ton of publicity. There were a couple of articles that had come out in 2012 that were all very flattering of Elizabeth and her, and her talents. And she was named top 30 under 30, top 40 under 40, all these different minor things that really ultimately didn't get picked up uh, by the press until a little bit later on. So the Theranos promise, for those of you who are not familiar with the company, the key takeaway is today to take blood samples for different tests, you have, you stop, you know, you go to a lab or you go to a hospital or you go to your physician's office, you, ha you might have somebody come to your actual house and take out blood. And that blood draw process is timely, it's, cons it's time consuming, it's extensive. They have to take out three huge vials depending on the number of tests that you have. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. And if you have a fear of needles, one of the big issues with blood draws that has occurred over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the issue is really that a lot of people who should be getting diagnostic tests don't end up getting diagnostic tests because of their fear of needles. So uh, Elizabeth Holmes, who has a self-proclaimed fear of needles and grew up with an uncle who you know, had several uh, diseases that she wanted to help him get you know, better access to, came up with this technology or, or decided that there was this technology that was worth validating, which was essentially collecting you know, 1.3 centimeter high vial called a nanotainer, a nano container, a really tiny container worth of blood and being able to extrapolate any sort of test, a battery of about 50 or 60 tests in the beginning from just that one tiny single drop of blood. So that was the key promise. Some other key aspects of, you know, this specific company, um, the pricing. So one of the things that you get when you have smaller nanotainers is that you get to do, you basically get a menu. So her theory was, you know, instead of going to the doctor, getting a prescription and saying, hey, go get this uh, blood test, her theory was it should be like a grocery store where you have a menu, you say, 
I want to know what my, uh, my potassium levels are. I want to know what my vitamin D levels are. I want to know what, you know, if I, have, if, I, if I could screen for this cancer, if I could screen for this. Basically a menu of options that you would choose off the shelf, essentially. And some of these options were priced about one-tenth or one-twentieth of what their uh, reimbursed rates are on a normal, you know, on a normal basis. So obviously this was a huge, huge win for the, for the industry. So they got a lot, they started receiving a lot of press starting about 2013 when that stealth mode uh, kind of emerged from its cocoon. So about 140 of these tests starting in uh, 2014 were under $10. So imagine you wake up one day and you say, I want to check my creatinine levels and I want to do it for 10 bucks. So I go, I, I take a, you know, I go to one of the Walgreens, which eventually sp partnered with Theranos and I take a little bit of uh, blood and I get to take that and I get to check that out for 10 bucks. Not a bad deal, right? It's like going to, I guess here it's Vons, yes, Vons, um, and really buying, you know, something off the shelf. So that was the Theranos promise. You know, another thing was this whole empowering of patients. So delivering the results right to you, not having to get screened out through a physician. This was really the, the, the patient empowerment movement was really emerging in, the, in you know, 2005, 2006, 2007. And that continued with the Theranos promise. They basically wanted to make sure you had access to everything and be, you had transparency to everything before you actually underwent this test. So very promising, right? I mean, if this, if this comes to fruition, who would, who would be a huge fan of that option? I think everybody, right? That, that's a really big thing. So this is an example of their blood test catalog. So you see things like, for example, um, adenovirus DNA, $29. Albumin, so that's, a, that's usually reimbursed at $30. That's something that was $3.37. So they basically had this test menu where you can theoretically go select your tests and call it a day. And this is what the nanotainer looks like. Their theory or their claim to fame was one tiny drop changes everything. And again, it's a 1.29 centimeter container. How does it compare to other ones? Well, this is what it looks like, right? So if you look, if you're doing a blood draw, and again, I just got my blood drawn two weeks ago. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of needles, but because I'm uh, big bones, <clears throat> um, I often cannot get, uh, you know, a needle draw through here. I often have to go through over here. And it's quite painful. It's not, you know, it's not fun. So for me, when I saw this originally a few years ago, I was like, man, this is awesome. I hope this, I hope this pans out. Because sitting there while the lady's trying to stick me 900 times and say, uh, sir, yes, your uh, patient profile is uh, difficult to get this. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I'm fat. I get it. I understand. Okay. So anyway, so that's what, you know, that's what this technology ended up, you know, looking like. Now, other, other good things started happening. The company started booming in 2013. Walgreens filed uh, some uh, partnerships with them. At one point, they had hundreds of centers that were about to be open. And the, the goal was really, you'd be at a Walgreens, you go do this quick draw, and you get your results. I mean, it was really kind of, uh, just like there's like the minute clinic theory for some of these other healthcare remedy or healthcare maladies, the Theranos approach was the same thing, but for blood containers. So that's really where they um, you know, started to emerge as a very, very uh, promising company. At that point in time, there was also a private equity firm that uh, committed almost $400 million to this company. At that point in time, Elizabeth Holmes became the quote unquote uh, richest self-made billionaire in the world. Um, and basically, you know, at that point, their valuation was $9 billion almost. $8 billion, $9 billion, depending on what term sheet you look at. But more or less, an $8 billion company, which, funny enough, in an article in Wired magazine, the first cracks in the Theranos case started emerging. They started saying, hmm, well, this is a $9 billion company. We're trying to look for peer-reviewed journals about their technology, can't find any. Okay, fine, some companies like to operate in stealth mode where they're very secretive, they, wanna, you know, they don't wanna release anything. So let's talk to some experts in the field. They, they surely must understand how this works. No experts in the field understood how it works. Okay, fine, so let's talk to regulators. Regulators definitely understand how this works, right? So they're the ones regulating them. No regulators refuse, all regulators refuse to speak on public comment regarding Theranos and similar technologies. So this Wired magazine article started, you know, there was a couple of questions that started emerging uh, fairly uh, late in 2013 uh, about this technology. Some of this also came from the two big players in the market. So Quest Diagnostics, LabCorp, 90% of you have probably used them for your blood tests. They represent about 20% of that overall lab market, right? The other 80% are in hospital, vi physician visits, all that stuff. But 20% of a huge market. So you can imagine that they started raising their own questions as well, which is interesting. So 
At that point in time, again, they were an $8 billion unicorn. Everybody familiar with the term unicorn? It's a company that's valued at over a billion dollars, right? A lot of these unicorns, it's a derogatory term because they end up going bust. At this point in time, again, $8 billion, I want to, I want to keep emphasizing that, $8 billion, $9 billion valuation. That means that people out there that were investing in this company, without having valid data supporting the theories, they were able to put this price tag on this company. Now, one thing I failed to mention that's very interesting to know is that the only way that this company, Theranos, claimed they can do their testing on that one droplet of blood was through a proprietary testing mechanism called Edison. It was basically their own certified, uh, validated system that was able to take this small blood drop, and it's the only system in the world that could have extrapolated all these different dozens of tests within that one drop. And that left a lot of scientists scratching their heads saying, man, that is fantastic. Your patents don't really enable this technology, so um, if that's the case, I'd really love to see how this works. Let's see some peer-reviewed studies. Radio silence. So keep that in mind. 2013, 2014, Elizabeth Holmes becomes a rock star. She is a legitimate healthcare rock star. If you've not seen this face before, um, I'm surprised. You probably are on Facebook too much, so please get off and look at your industry. Um, so Fortune, Inc., Wired, Forbes. Funny enough, one of, the, one of the best articles that emerged about Elizabeth Holmes, one of the most flattering, was from the Wall Street Journal. And if, for, some of the, for some of you who are familiar with this story, you'll find out why that's kind of ironic. But Wall Street Journal featured Elizabeth in one of their articles. And again, very flattering praise. Everything was, you know, peachy keen, perfect, right? And I'm trying to find one quote that I love particular that I'm going to save for a little bit. But um, anyway, so 2014, 2013, she's getting featured in all these articles. Theranos is blowing up. They sign additional investors. They sign additional Safeway is another uh, area where 800 clinics are starting to get opened up for them to do their tests. I mean, this company is just booming. And then... Just when they were starting to get some what they call haters in the field, right? FDA clears one of their tests. So they basically slammed it in, in everyone's face saying, ha, you see that? FDA cleared one of our tests using the 510K mechanism, which is a very stringent and complicated and world-class mechanism. Okay, so that's, that's there. Okay, so they got the FDA clearance. Everything's going well. Then this guy shows up. Anybody know who this is? John Kerry, yep. So for months, John Kerry from the Wall Street Journal had been calling, and again, let me just be clear, a lot of this is alleged, right? Because you cannot fully vet, just like they haven't validated the technology necessarily, I can't validate some of this stuff, it's all hearsay, right? But he claims that for many months he was requesting an audience with Theranos. He was hearing rumblings in the back about how some of this technology wasn't valid, he received some, uh, you know, some whistleblower cases, some whistleblower information from some disgruntled ex-employees. There was a lot of, you know, smoke that was starting to emerge about this company that it really couldn't do what it claimed to do. So John pursued this consistently over, over five, six months, gave them several opportunities to answer, and he basically indicates that they never, never answered. So basically, um, the bottom line here is, per his side of the story, Elizabeth Holmes would take every single opportunity she could, as well as the rest of the Theranos uh, staff, to go into flattering pieces, to do featured articles where it was flattering about them. However, when it came to his article, which was questioning their technology a little bit, and at that point he indicates he wasn't planning on, on doing this destruction piece. He just wanted to get some clarity and actually help them. Because again, Wall Street Journal was helping them get out you know, into the public. They were doing a good service for them. So he, his goal was just to say, hey, can we just refute these things real quick and that way you, know, you guys have a, a smooth sailing? Some people on the other side say that he had a vendetta. Who knows? But long story short, he ends up publishing an article on October of 2015, which really represents, I hope not the death knell, but really the beginning of the end for Theranos if they end up being an end. I hope not, because the technology is so cool and so novel that I do, I do hope it becomes validated. But this was really the cascade of, the, of that, that negative spiral that happens over this last two years, right? Or this last year, sorry. So the article is entitled, Hot Startup Theranos to Struggle with Its Blood Test Technology. Seems simple enough, right? Nothing, nothing too crazy. It's just saying, hey, they've struggled with some of the technology. But some of the things that emerged from that article were very, very interesting. The first thing was that several disgruntled employees said, hey, you know that Edison machine that we're supposed to be using to test our blood containers? 
We use it for less than 10% of our tests. We actually use off-the-shelf stuff from Siemens and from Roche to do our analytical tests in our lab. So that started to emerge as an interesting comment from these disgruntled employees. Obviously, Theranos' pushback was they're disgruntled employees. They want to just, you know, they, they want to get back at us. So that was one of the themes that started emerging. The other thing that started emerging is that their knowledge of regulatory compliance and quality practices were fairly deficient. Um, and that'll come to light here in a few minutes. But basically, at the end of 2014, and by that time the article was published, it was clear that there were some issues with the way that um, you know, Theranos was conducting their tests. Now, they never disclosed publicly before their fundraising that they were doing those tests with non-Edison machines, with off-the-shelf machines. So you could imagine why that would be an issue, right? If you're claiming that you can do a specific test or you can do something new that the industry cannot do by extrapolating, you know, by extracting one drop of blood, testing using a proprietary Edison tool, and basically coming up with results at a lower cost, yet what you're actually doing is extracting that blood, diluting some of the samples and sticking it into, and again, allegedly diluting some of the samples and sticking it into, um, you know, off-the-shelf analyzers then your technology isn't really validated. So that's what was emerging. Now, a lot of this was happening in parallel while Elizabeth Holmes was still building her brand. In fact, before this article came out, there was a $200 million pledge from a, a, an investment group that was supposed to come out and it never emerged because of all these issues. So uh, that was something that I think really did not, did not bode well for the company. Now, what, this hap what happens is that when you have this phrase on your website, one tiny drop changes everything, and now it's really maybe, because we're not sure, a um, couple things ended up happening. They did a, a company did a gap analysis, essentially, of Theranos' website pre-October 2015 and post-October 2015, and found seven major changes within the website. And a lot of it was, what do you think the changes were? Anybody? Give me one example of a change in verbiage or text. Sure, but yep, making the, the language more vague. What else? Yep, so that language, that vagueness, also um, started saying, basically claiming that they could do things without, or uh, they, they, they could potentially do it with Edison. Edison was one way of many to get the samples. A lot of different redactions from their website that really came up um, you know, during this time frame. So, as you can imagine, Theranos fired back, ton of, ton of back and forth. Um, studies were, were finally released by a lot of these labs that had been saying that Theranos' uh, test data was not valid. One of the biggest difficulties is, so remember how I told you that most of their tests were not conducted on their Edison machines? So the ones that were conducted on their Edison machines had significant differences between those tests and tests that were done at typical laboratories or traditional laboratories. So you can, t you can obviously tell that this is a major concern, right? If you're getting a lab test for uh, alkaline phosphates and your, your test with Theranos is significantly different than the test you get you know, in a clinic, that can drive a different diagnosis decision. So that's very much a un invalid test, right? The test is not getting you results that are actionable by a physician. So this, again, was the biggest reason that Theranos was, again, becoming under scrutiny. Now, Theranos had an answer for all of this. So in full transparency, they do have an answer for absolutely everything that I've presented. So if you're interested in that, go to the Theranos website. There's some information there. Do your own due diligence, blah, blah, blah. Um, but long story short, you know, having done this for, for a bit, there was some stuff there that was a bit questionable. So, uh, but full transparency, they, they have been able to answer all of these allegations. Not successfully, because you still don't find one big person, you know, uh, or well-known physician or well-known diagnostic expert defending them. However, uh, this is the case. So, more importantly, just this year, in January 2016, CMS found significant quality deficiencies with one of their, with several of their labs, and in fact, to the point where um, they were, uh, they're potentially revoking a lot of their tests so that they do not get Medicare coverage, which is a huge, which would be a huge blow. Uh, for this company. So CMS got involved, FDA, we haven't talked about FDA yet, but all these different agencies, New York Health Department got involved, a lot of these different agencies started basically coming up with independent inspections and reports about how Theranos' tests were invalid. And this was the most recent piece of news, and this was just this month, where uh, Theranos founder Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Holmes 
was under consideration for being banned. Now, whether this happens or not, uh, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say it, it probably would not happen unless they don't resolve their uh, deficiencies in a timely manner. However, one of their biggest issues has been when they get a deficiency notice, they have not been able to respond in a timely manner. So their CMS deficiency had 10 days for response. Um, you know, the FDA, when they issued their 483s, they had several, uh, you know, a time frame for response. Um, you know, whenever they get, whenever they get asked for peer-reviewed journals by a, an independent publication or an independent organization entity, they have X amount to response, and they usually um, have failed to respond in a timely manner. So, you know, this is what we're going to focus on the rest of today, because this is our world, right? We live in FDA world. Anybody in an IVD company or a diagnostic company? Okay. So you guys know that, you know, medical devices include IVDs per Section 201H for the, QSR, or the Code of Federal Regulations, and this is our world. We live under FDA. So we, we kind of skipped over the FDA aspect of this. Remember, FDA cleared Theranos' product, right? You saw that clearance. I didn't make that up. They cleared it. But we're going to get to why that's very important. In October of 2015, not only did this Wall Street Journal article came out, but boom, perfect timing, FDA issues 243s. Everyone familiar with what a 43 is? It's basically systemic deficiencies within your quality system uh, in your facility. So this was issued. And what I'm going to go through is really some takeaways from these 43s that we can learn about. Because a lot of these 43s, again, are not new. So let's go through some of them. There's fact and fiction in this Theranos case study. The fact is that there are systemic issues, issues at Theranos. It's clear. Some of the stuff is very basic. You know, how can a company be valued at $9 billion without having a post-market surveillance program, right? That's, that's like a, a very basic part of medical devices. That's in special controls. You're doing a 510K, you get post-market surveillance. You probably learned that yesterday in the 510K workshop. So really, that's a fact. You can't deny that, right? The fiction is that these are unique or first seen with Theranos. In fact, if you look at their different types of deficiencies, design control, complaint files, CAPA, and regulatory deficiencies, this is the FDA trends and warning letters and 43s over the last you know, few years, 2011 to 2015, okay? So you see kind of some common hitters here. Design controls, CAPA, complaint files. God, if companies ever figured out how to do complaint and CAPAs and design controls, I'd have no job. So, you know, please, please pay, don't pay attention to this right now. Go back to sleep. Um, so this is the common recurring theme in medical device companies. I'm going to highlight in red which ones Theranos had issues with, okay? At, at least they received their stuff correctly. That's good. So that's, that's interesting. All right. But, you know, can you, can you tell that a lot of these issues are not issues, quality system deficiencies, that just Theranos has? All, a lot of companies do. I mean, again, you know, I say it jokingly, but a lot of our work that we do is FDA remediation work. So we go to companies that have these issues and fix them, right? So it, it's, it's common. It's not a matter of when it, uh, if it happens, it's when it happens. In fact, if you look at some of these, CAPA, complaint files, design control, production process control is not on here, but process validation is another you know, recurring issue with companies. It's also part of the quality system inspection technique from FDA. So quality system inspection technique, for, for those of you who might not be familiar, is basically the FDA's manuals to its inspectors on what are the big focal points of the quality system. And it lists five different subparts. Guess what some of those are? CAPA, complaints, production process controls, design controls. They're all there, right? So it's not just companies struggling. FDA acknowledges that these are some of the most critical aspects of being a medical design developer. So let's go through some of these observations or deficiencies and see how can we prevent them? How can we avoid them? The first one, design validation did not ensure that the device conforms to defined user needs and intended uses. So what's really difficult here is, is the right product being built? Now, in context of what you heard for design validation, maybe you don't know exactly what 82030 says about design validation, right? Do you think that their design was validated? Well, again, we don't have exposure to their, pub, to their private records, but from what it looks like from the public, again, allegedly, their design was not validated properly. It didn't show that it can actually extract that blood and do those tests in a way that was comparable to a laboratory test. Remember, they were cleared using the 510K mechanism. Thus, they had to prove substantial equivalence to some other test, lab test. And you saw in that previous comparison, when they were put up an independent test versus a typical lab test, they failed. 
right? So just by that, they were not able to meet their intended use, their indications, which in this case was to diagnose certain disease states, certain molecules, certain entities using their technology. So in that point, their design was not valid. One of the things to do when you have this type of issue, and one of the things that I find always when a company gets cited under A2030 for, the, for design validation is that they fail to separate you know, what their intended use, what their indications say versus what their technical requirements are. They seem to kind of bucket that all together and put it into one document or into one area. And one of the things that we try to do as companies is make sure we identify who those stakeholders are, who those users are. Those users can be the patients, the physicians, it all depends. And those are really what the FDA considers concept documentation per their FDA guidance, right? So those are, that's kind of the first step. Understand how your intended use is translated to these user needs because ultimately that design validation is going to be performed against these needs. So that's one of the first things that you can take a look at within your company is do we do a good job of distinguishing between technical requirements and some of these higher level conceptual requirements that the FDA calls concept documents. So that's one of the things to consider. And the easiest thing to ask yourself is are you going to go to a doctor and the doctor's going to say, you know, hey, I want a catheter that has a tensile strength of 10 newtons. No, they're probably going to say, hey, this thing probably shouldn't break, right? because we don't want to kill our patients. That's, that's something that's a user need. And that's, what'll be, that's something that will be validated through design validation. Translating those into technical requirements, into design input requirements, is that second step, right? So for example, if Theranos had an IVD, if an, a nanotainer, and that nanotainer was supposed to uh, you know, keep a certain volume, that might be a technical requirement. The user need that corresponds to that might be, hey, we need sufficient volume to do these tests. Right? So you go high level, lower level, more in detail. And then design validation itself, benchtop testing, clinical trials, usability studies, simulated use testing, it didn't seem that Theranos really was able to demonstrate to FDA that they did a lot of those things that's typical of design validation. So really that's why they were cited under that observation. One of the key things for design validation is to perform these tests under simulated use conditions. So Theranos was cited for not performing their design validation testing under simulated use conditions. What that means is you can imagine if you're uh, doing an assay, this actually happened to me once, we were, performing, we were doing an assay for combat zones. And within the test plan, the combat zones were in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. So what do you think is something that might be different about those environments versus Minnesota, where I'm, I'm currently from? Temperature, right? So if I test this, if I use this assay outside, which this assay in particular was used outside often, within negative 20 degrees, which unfortunately is my reality for several weeks. Um, do you think it, would, it might give the same results as if you tested it in 120 degrees Fahrenheit? Maybe, but we don't know, so we have to validate that, right? So that's simulated use conditions. Ensure that when you're doing your medical device development, you do that. And you obviously heard of some of that uh, yesterday, but just kind of driving the home point, the point home. Now, the other thing that companies fail to do, and, and Theranos failed to do this as well, is to perform testing on what's called production equivalent units. Production equivalence is essentially, you ask yourself this question, hey, the stuff that I got on the market, that it's going to go to market, is it the same stuff that I used to test for design validation and to submit to FDA those results with? And if your answer is no, or you can't really justify why they're equivalent, that's why you're going to get cited for that particular observation. Okay? So how do you do that? You can do a bomb gap analysis. You look at your bill of materials. Is it the same product? No? Then why is it, why can I say that, you know, this material that was used for design verification validation is quote unquote production equivalent? Well, it has the same uh, tensile strength. It has the same, uh, you know, material makeup. It should perform the same as the one that we're going to go to commercial with. Fine. Cool. Use environment. Again, there's a new standard that came out, IC 62366-1. It's a usability uh, guidance. It's something that everyone should be aware of. When you're doing your testing, make sure that you do human factors. And that really shows that you're con considering the use environment. So all this is part of what Theranos could have done to avoid that issue. And design input requirements were not adequately uh, documented. We talked about design input requirements a little bit, but basically they didn't define the product fully. So what that could mean is that in this case, they didn't translate those user needs into those more technical requirements as this observation claim. This is a, a, another big aspect of the observations. Who knows what 14971 is? You guys probably all know it, right? You guys are all experts in it. Okay. Using a consensus standard or a consensus recognized standard by FDA or an EU, you know, just a harmonized standard is a really good way of showing compliance to risk analysis, right? So how do you assess 
and determine which risks are acceptable. Have you done risk-benefit analysis? One aspect of risk-benefit analysis, which is part of risk analysis, is, hey, what's out there that does these same tests, right? It's a, it's a, it's a comparison. Alternate therapies. In this case, Theranos' alternate therapies would probably be the diagnostics being run at different clinics, right? So they would, be, they would want to say, why is ours better or as, you know, as good, essentially, uh, as those? So that's part of the risk analysis. It's really understanding what are the potential design issues within your product and what are the risks associated with them. And that's part of the things that they didn't do. Now, another observation that they had here was documents were not reviewed and approved. So this is one of the biggest things with startups, right? It's document control, getting things signed off, changes, getting uh, you know, issues, getting design changes, process changes. You know, who approves them? How do you demonstrate that you've signed off on them? Some companies use manual processes. Some companies use enterprise uh, quality management systems, right? So all these different types of Grand Avenue, Greenlight.Guru, all these different platforms that you can use to do document control. Theranos failed to adequately document uh, that their documents were reviewed and approved by somebody. So essentially, if Elizabeth Holmes were you know, having a bad day and she said, you know what, I, wanted to, I want to change the way this process works, she could have walked in there, changed the process, and it never would have been approved by somebody. So that's what document control does. Uh, you know, within your quality system, and that's one of the things that they were cited for. Um, with document control, having a dedicated document management system is the key to prevent those type of observations, right? So it can be manual, but a lot of times you have an EQMS solution that can help you, you know, figure out electronic signatures, electronic records, maintain them, get them approved by the right people. There's always help in that type of solution. So this is one solution that I like to use called greenlight.guru, but basically you can kind of put all your stuff into one platform and say, hey, you know, I got, a, I got a couple documents routing for approval right now. We can't make this design change until we get the VP of quality, the engineering manager, and the VP of uh, clinical labs to approve this. So that's one of the ways that document control can be uh, effective within your company. So you don't get those type of observations that Theranos did. Another observation here, devices for which listing is required have not been listed. So this was their nanotainer. Remember how I said FDA cleared their product? Remember? I, remember? Okay. So here's the thing. If you look at the actual clearance letter, I'm going to read it here. Theranos today announced that it has received the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's clearance of its test system and test for herpes simplex 1 virus. Okay, why is this important? If I'm a company and I say that I have 150 types of tests that I conduct using this one single drop, and I get FDA clearance for herpes simplex, am I allowed to now use this product for the rest of the 149 tests? Who says true? Who says false? Well, good, you guys are smart. You guys all attended that workshop yesterday, so I'm sure you guys are experts in this now, but basically, yeah, this is, this is what happened. So regulators were claiming, hey, hold on for a second. We cleared you for herpes. We did not clear, sorry, that sounds really bad. We cleared you for herpes. <laughs> we cleared your product for use with herpes simplex. Not all of these other things that you're saying. If that's the case, you either have to do two things, right? You have, to you have to validate each one of those tests individual individually or provide some sort of rationale or strategy that, look, 30 of these tests, we're doing one test and it's, you know, uh, you know, it's comparable to these rest, so th those all are validated. But they didn't even do that. And obviously, there's been several FOIA, Freedom of Information Act requests for the, the, clear the response. But long story short, intended use within your 510K is critical, right? So if your indication or your intended use in this case is for this specific disease state for diagnosis, you're not going to be able to leverage that for the rest of your tests. So that was one of the keys that, um, you know, Theranos got in trouble for. Clinical rationale as well. So this is a, a really interesting case study that came out in Scientific American where a huge panel of different physicians and uh, laboratory technicians as well as, uh, you know, PhDs in the, in the matter, in the subject matter said, uh, who told you, or, or basically saying to Theranos, theoretically, they said, who told you that blood taken from your finger is different than blood, or is, is the same as blood taken from your, you know, from veins, right, from other veins? And their argument was, there are a lot of molecules that you can draw analogous conclusions from if you pinprick versus, you know, systemic blood. However, there's a lot of proteins, lipids, and other molecules that you cannot. So basically, they, this panel came out and they said, we have been asking for information for years. We've never received information. You guys must have this, I'm paraphrasing, uh, you guys must have this phenomenal like new age technology that allows you to basically extract 150 type of tests from your finger, 
And that's really not the case. So that was one of the big things that came out. Long story short, when you're developing a test or you're developing your indications and your intended use, you should have clinical rationale for that. I mean, I know that sounds like a duh, but you'll be surprised at how many times a company will emerge with a technology and they won't defend their clinical rationale for selecting that technology. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so complaints. Long story short, this observation was, hey, you guys have no way of, com of, uh, of looking at complaints. You guys don't assess complaints. You don't have a formal post-market program. Now, post-market program is part of a being a class two device. So whenever you kind of upgrade in classification per FDA, right? So you start with class one, you end up in class three. The type of controls you have to follow also increase. In class one, you follow general controls. That's things like listing your product, you know, make sure that you're not misbranding or adulterating your product. Kind of some very basic, uh, you know, you have to do this as a medical device manufacturer. As soon as you hop into class two and you designate yourself as a class two device that requires a 510K, you're gonna have to follow something called special controls. And that includes a little bit more detail, but not something that a $9 billion valued company should not have invested in. So we'll talk a little bit about what that is. For general controls, here's a couple things that you need to follow as a medical device manufacturer. The first one is adulteration, misbranding, device registration and listing. What was that observation? What did it say? You failed to register and list one of your medical devices, that nanotainer. Because again, that nanotainer you said works for this, this specific disease state, but not for all these others. So frankly, that's what's considered a misbranded or adulterated product. A product that is found to be deficient per its quality system and not really meeting its in intended use that it was filed on. So those are three things that Theranos, even under general controls, did not comply with. So that's a huge issue, right? Under special controls, that observation that I told you, the no complaints program, they did not implement a post-market surveillance program. So what that means is, once you get your product to market, you have to have a unit or at least a designated individuals who are responsible for collecting complaints, customer feedback, and assessing whether or not they're critical or they're high risk enough, which in this case, they didn't have proper risk analysis, so that would've been tough anyway. But in this case, you really have to do that, right? That's part of being a 510K cleared product, having that post-market surveillance program. Patient registries, performance standards, uh, special labeling requirements, all this was stuff that they got clearance on for one product, but when it came to their quality system inspection, they failed some of the quality system regulation uh, requirements. And one of those was post-market surveillance. So another thing is that CAPA, right? Corrective and preventive actions were not documented. So who knows what CAPA is? Who deals with CAPA on a daily basis? So long story short, when you get bad info or you get info about a potential quality system deficiency or product deficiency or other no type of nonconformance, you have to evaluate it to determine whether or not you need to take any sort of corrective actions to address it and then preventive actions to make sure it doesn't happen again, it doesn't recur, right? But however, preventive action also includes, or actually specifically is, looking at other areas of your quality system of your products to determine, to make sure that this doesn't happen, this type of issue doesn't happen again. So that being said, you know, CAPA is a lot of the work that we do in remediation. And there's a couple things that I usually recommend for CAPA that you have to have in place which is the, easy way, the easiest way to defend yourself within an FDA uh, inspection or notified body audit. The first thing is an escalation process. So a lot of people say, hey, you know what? Everything's a kappa. You know, everything requires corrective action. Every nonconformance needs to be escalated. That's not true. In fact, if you look at the two types of guidance that I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, long story short, with corrective actions and preventive actions, the actions you take should be commensurate with the risk of your product, okay, or the risk of the issue. And we'll go into that a little bit here. But here are some things that might trigger you to, have, to implement a corrective action or preventive action. Is it a high risk? Has it happened again? So if something happens over and over and over again and you don't fix it, what does the FDA think? Well, you really don't, you don't have good management controls over your system. Your quality system is deficient because you don't address this thing that keeps happening over and over again. So doing trend analysis saying, hey, you know, this specific issue has happened multiple times, that's something that might trigger a capo. Now, if you look at this CAPA guidance, if, if some of you are not familiar, GHTF, Global Harmonization Task Force, they're now called something else, IM, IMDRF, sorry. Um, they change like every 10 years. But basically, their guidance suggests that the manufacturer should process uh, corrective actions and preventive actions commensurate with the significance of the nonconformity. So one of the key things that your companies, your takeaway from this, from all this hubbub, basically is not every single type of nonconformance 
needs to have a corrective action issued. You can trend it, you can track it, you can determine by risk whether it's critical. This is something that's in that guidance as well as the, a the Amy Quality System Compendium, which is a, a manual that I love to use. It says the same thing. The potential nonconformance escalation should be appropriate for the magnitude of the problem and for the risks encountered. Now, a lot of these problems that, that Theranos is encountering, a lot of those are probably internal kappas, right? If they keep getting post-market complaints, if this Wall Street Journal article, these other inputs, those are probably kappa worthy. Things that are high risk to the company, high risk to the product, they should probably escalate those. And I'm going to skip over a couple of things in the interest of time. This is just a, a kind of escalation criteria. You take all these different inputs from audits, complaints, reviews, service, and you basically determine if you need to escalate those nonconformances into your Kappa system for improvement. So I have to skip a lot because I have some time left and obviously I don't know how to control my time. So um, we're going to skip through a couple other things. Purchasing controls and quality audits are things that they got uh, in trouble with. I'll send you these slides so you can take a look at it. Um, the last thing I'll talk about though is, is this, which is management responsibility. So one of the things with your quality system is your quality system grows, right? When you're a small company, you might have a tailored quality system that's lean, that focuses on the, ma on the four major subparts, production process controls, Kappa, complaint files, design controls, right? As you grow, as you become a $9 billion valued company, you might want to implement a more robust quality management system. And that's part of what this aspect of the quality system regulation or subpart G under subpart B really talks about. How does management determine whether your quality system is suitable and effective? That's done through management reviews, audits, and other internal and external uh, in influences. So when you're looking at suitability, is the quality system appropriate for our company? You know, one thing that Theranos could have done is if they're doing a management review, they could determine, hey, we just got a bunch of 43s from the FDA, CMS is on us, we probably have to determine whether we have some quality system deficiencies that we need to address. And in fact, one of their responses did indicate that they're going to address them. Effectiveness, are we meeting our quality policy and objectives? Interval and frequency, how often do we need to look at our quality system? Let me ask you a question. If I'm a class one dental floss manufacturer, am I going to take a look at my quality system more or less than Theranos who just got two 43s? What do you guys think? Yeah, right, so my management review might be once a year, right, or once, uh, you know, once every two years, if you will. Once a year is usually the minimum, right, is the minimum. But Theranos might be doing quarterly management reviews right now, right, because they're getting such negative publicity and negative issues with their, with their, uh, with their products. So that's one of the things you want to consider when you're doing management reviews. Um, last but not least, one of the key takeaways, is anybody an investor in this uh, room? Okay, so one of the things that I do uh, that I really enjoy as my, in my job is doing due diligence for companies, for investors uh, who are looking to, you know, to put money into company. If any of these, you know, uh, investors who would have looked at Theranos prior to their investment in 2014 or 2013 would have done a little bit of digging, they would have realized that doing quality and regulatory due diligence is a critical aspect uh, of this process. It's understanding what's their regulatory path, how their quality system looks, so that they don't get to this, this October 2015 timeline uh, and basically everything hits the fan. So one of the things I very much encourage you, if you're an investor or even if you're a company looking to get investment, have an independent due diligence strategy with somebody. Hire a consultant, hire somebody internally, hire one of your board members to do this assessment so that you prevent these type of issues like Theranos went under. So, And last but not least, um, can Theranos come back? 23andMe, this personal genomics, personal gene health company, they got cited by the FDA uh, a couple years back now, 2013 as well. The key difference is they're now selling their director consumer kits after resolving their issues, resolving their deficiencies, validating their product. It, it's not analogous, quite, quite analogous, but it's very similar because they basically were questioned on hey, do we want everybody to have access to this data, and is the data you're providing valid? They underwent a two or three year remediation effort, and I just actually ordered my 23andMe kit a couple months ago, and I'm still waiting for the results. So it's something that companies can come back from. They didn't get hit as hard from the press, but you know, the key takeaway here, just to end, is basically, if you're gonna get promoted in the press, especially by the tech press, you gotta be able to lear learn to live and die by them. You get brought up by them, you're going to get crashed down by them as well. So you got to take the good and the bad. 
Yep, and that's kind of the takeaway here, right? So when you raise $9 billion, make sure you have a quality system that's robust. So Dave, that's it for me. You are Thank a you. very gifted speaker. You're a gifted speaker, a brave speaker. Thank you. Um, if I end up dead tonight, you know where to go. No, but don't leave the podium just yet. While okay. we're out of time, I do want to ask one question. You mentioned one of the things that you do is you help companies do due diligence before investing. Yep. A uh, quick plug for yourself. What else might we hire you as a consultant to do for us? Uh, so right now, the focus of, our, our pract of my specific practice is um, I do a lot of work in combination products. So 505B2s are kind of our preferred mechanism. It's basically combination product, drug and a device, which who regulates it from FDA depends on that primary mode of action. Is it primarily a drug or primarily a device? When you stick them both together, you basically submit to the FDA branch that is that mode of action. So we do a lot of that work, the regulatory strategy, quality system strategy, um, as well as other regulatory and quality stuff, which I won't bore you with because you're you know, probably going to fall asleep. So. Okay. Thank you. David Amore. Thanks, everybody. Nice job. Thanks,